Open your Bibles with me this morning to Mark chapter 9. <clears throat> and maybe you can't hear it in my voice, but uh, Clay was about ready to preach it this morning. And so at 9 o'clock, I came in, hard-headed as could be, and said, no, I think I'm going to try it. So if my voice fails, if I, uh, if I cough and splutter, just know that uh, it's, it's my stubbornness and uh, attempt to uh, please the Lord that I stand before you this morning. Mark chapter 9. This morning we look backwards at a text we have uh, previously skipped over. Um, I paused and, and went forward a little bit one week. But this morning we look at verses 11 through 13, a very small section here. Um, but it's a very deep and I think teachable section. And so this morning as my voice goes, I'll try to keep it brief and uh, it might not be as entertaining as most, but there's a lot of information here, I think, that points us in different directions in Scripture and which is important to look at. Mark chapter 9, verses 11 through 13. And this morning, my sermon is entitled, Elijah and the Coming of the Lord. And you can probably guess, if you're any uh, Bible scholar at all, uh, where, where I'm planning to go with these things. Elijah is an Old Testament figure, um, an Old Testament um, prophet, and he plays a, a very large um, role there as one of the prophets of Israel. However, um, he also makes many New Testament appearances throughout Scripture and is intricately tied with Jesus' first and second coming. And so with that in mind, uh, we have to consider our context here of the transfiguration, all that has taken place. And now Jesus and, and the disciples have this dialogue about this Old Testament figure and what it means for both Jesus' coming now in the flesh. And I believe it kind of parallels some things that we'll see when we look into Revelation and, as we've already read, in Malachi, looking towards those end times. So this morning, would you stand with me as we look at Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. We'll read through verse 13. <coughs> Hear now the words of the living and true God. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. And yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this morning that we have to gather in your house, and we thank you that your presence is here amongst us in your Holy Spirit. Lord, we cling to the reality that where two or more are gathered, here you are in our midst. Lord, as we open your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us through it, and that by your word we might be changed. Lord, we thank you for the testimony of your promises and your truths this morning in baptism. And Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our church. Lord, we ask as we read your word now that you would continue to work amongst us, and we ask all of this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. So Elijah has already been important in the story of Jesus. Uh, Mark's gospel especially highlights Elijah's role, and that's why we see him co come up now as well. But remember, Mark's gospel starts differently than all of the other gospels. Matthew and Luke begin with an infancy narrative, a, a telling of the, the story of Jesus with Mary and Joseph and what happened on that night in Bethlehem, where John doesn't necessarily have an infancy narrative, but does look to Christ as this timeless, eternal figure who created all things. It goes back further than Jesus' ministry itself. Remember Mark's ministry, though. Mark highlights Jesus' ministry beginning with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist comes in the spirit of Elijah, hence the title this morning and where this, where this comes from and what I think Jesus primarily is referring to here. He comes in the spirit of Elijah, to make way the ready the path of the Lord. And so as we look this morning and we see what Jesus has to say here, I think it certainly does look back to John the Baptist. In verse 11, we have his disciples <coughs> asking him, why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? They're, they're having some questions here about what is this saying that the Jews of Jesus' day ha have said over and over again? And Jesus here, not seeing them even ask of John the Baptist, brings John the Baptist into kind of this focal point here when he says, verse 12, Elijah does first come 
basically recognizing where the Jews have been wrong in many other instances, they're right in this instance. And he says in verse 13, he has indeed come. And they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. And so first, I think this saying of Jesus here looks to what has already happened in John the Baptist. John the Baptist, in the spirit of Elijah, has indeed already came. And we remember in Mark's gospel what was done to John the Baptist, but he was beheaded for the pleasure of Herod and Herodias. That in this wicked act, whatever they wanted to do to him was done to him, just as Jesus says here in verse 13. And so I think on on, on this idea of the timeline of the Messiah, when is Jesus coming? When is the Messiah coming? When is the Christ going to come and bring his kingdom into fruition? We see it's going to happen just as the scriptures have said. And indeed, he has already come. And so one reading of this would be to say, Elijah has come in order to usher in the day of the Messiah. But I think it speaks more to this, especially when we look at the context of where Mark has put this in his gospel. Remember, up to this point, Mark has told us the story of Jesus, and there's been this ongoing theme of, who is Jesus? Is he just another teacher? Is he just another prophet? Is he just another special character of the Bible? And Jesus in chapter 8 looks at his disciples and he says, who do the people say that I am? Really this question that's been teased out throughout the gospel, now Jesus brings it to the forefront and says, well, what do the people actually say? Let's talk about it. And they say, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're this or that. And Jesus looks and he says to his disciples, who do you say that I am. And in this climactic moment in Mark chapter 8, Peter looks at Jesus and says, you are Christ, the Son of God. You are the Messiah. He recognizes identifying correctly who Jesus is. And I think from that moment on, what we've seen in Mark chapter 8 and in Mark chapter 9 is the question is trans- transitioned from who is Jesus to What's going to happen to Jesus? Immediately after this identification, we see this passage in Scripture where Jesus says, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to resurrect. And when all of these things are told to the disciples, Peter rebukes Jesus and says, Jesus, that's not going to happen. And Jesus makes the comment, get behind me, Satan. It surely is going to happen. This is what must happen. And the rest of chapter 9 has been Jesus showing his glory, going back to this understanding of, I certainly do have to suffer and die. And so when we look at this and we ask the question, well, Jesus, what do the scribes say of Elijah? Jesus' answer is not only to say John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, but I think more than this, it is to say, and his coming and what happened to him In no way negates what has to happen to me. Look what Jesus says in verse 12. (coughs) In his answer to them, he says, Elijah does first come. He recognizes they're right, and he restores all things. And yet, and this is where Jesus is answering a question that they haven't asked. It's a question that in the context of Mark 9, we see, though, what's supposed to happen to Jesus. And the disciples think they're going to pit Jesus in, just like the Jews think. And they're going to say, well, Jesus, if Elijah's coming, says that the Christ is here and the Messiah has come to restore his kingdom. Well, then Jesus, how can you say that you're going to die? Essentially, this is really what the disciples are asking. And Jesus sees this and in verse 12 answers them this way. And yet, how is it written? We might even add in there. How is it also written of the Son of Man? that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt. The disciples here in questioning, certainly, Jesus, you can't suffer and die. Look to the revelation, the prophecy. Elijah must come before the Christ. Jesus says he has come, but that doesn't mean that I won't suffer and die in the same way that he did. Jesus here looking to Elijah recognizes that even though Elijah has come, to spearhead the beginning of the Messianic ministry, this in no way negates the fact that Jesus must 
die. And I think the beautiful thing we see here in the context of Mark is this dichotomy between the will of man and the will of God. The disciples love Jesus, that's without doubt, but they don't understand why Jesus has come. Ever since they have correctly identified him as Christ, they've looked for a way, a way, a way to talk him out of going to the cross, to say, no, you're not going to die, Jesus. You're going to take your throne. But what they don't recognize is that in the will of God to make these things happen, it means that sometimes it's going to happen outside of the rationale of man. That just because the prophecy comes true, just because the king has come, does not mean the king will take his throne in the conventional way, in a way that makes sense to us. What sense does it make in human conception that Christ would come to take his kingdom and he would do so not by force, but by laying his life down as a sacrifice for many? That doesn't make any sense to us. If there's anything that you and I want to get out of this world, what is the man way of doing it? It's by force. It's by argumentation. It's by a heavy hand. That's how the world works. Jesus, to come in as Christ foretold of by the coming of Elijah, he should walk in and just sit upon his throne. But instead, what do we see? Instead, Christ does not go to the throne in Jerusalem. Christ goes to the cross in Jerusalem. And I think this is an application here in the midst of, I think, a complicated couple of verses here that we can step back and we can say, if there's anything else I learned from this, let's take this home today. It's that when I think I know the way forward, when I think I know the way that would be the best way, when I think I have my plan set and I know what I would do if it was up to me, let's step back and recognize that the will of God often doesn't work that way. And many of us this morning, we might say, I'm, I'm suffering financial hardship. I'm suffering with my health. My family might be in shambles. Things are happening that are out of my control, and I don't know what to say to them. I don't know what to do to them. Maybe some of us might sit there and we might say, yeah, I know what happened in those situations. I'm at fault, and it was my sin that got me in those situations. But there are some people, and this is the real question of our day is, well, what do I do when things are going wrong? And I look around and I say, well, God, I thought I did everything right. What do we do then? I think we have to step back in and we have to recognize that even when it doesn't look like it makes sense from a man's perspective, we have to recognize we serve a God who sacrificed his own son and that all might be saved. He did the most insane thing. He went the most roundabout way from human rationale to accomplish the greatest task of all time. And so I speak to your situation and I say, here's a thing you can take from Elijah. Here's a thing you can take from the questioning of the disciples this morning. Your situation is not without hope. It might not be the way you would have taken to get there, but God is in control. His will often doesn't make sense to man. But I want you to know, church, his will is perfect and complete. His will, most of all, has the betterment of the people he loves in store. And if we struggle with this idea that God loves us enough that he would make his, his plans work out for our betterment, if we struggle with that, we've missed the cross completely. And that Christ died, he sent his son to die out of his great love for us. The will of man oftentimes does not coincide with the will of God. Oftentimes it's completely incomprehensible to man, but trust what God has and his plan moving forward. Elijah coming does not necessarily mean that Christ does not have to die. This is all part of God's plan. But finally, I think what we see here in our passage this morning is not only a timeline for the Messiah and John the Baptist, is not only a, 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 a contextual issue of whether or not Jesus should die, but is also a look towards something that's far out on the horizon, the second coming of the Son of Man. We read in Malachi chapter 4 this morning, and in those verses we saw that Elijah was connected to the return of Christ. If we can get it back up on the screen or turn in your Bibles with me to Malachi 
chapter 4, I'm going to look very briefly at verses 5 and 6. It's interesting that this is the last book of the Bible. In the last two verses of the last chapter of the Bible, the very end of the Old Testament, and it looks forward to everything that's going to happen with Christ in his first and his second coming. (coughs) Malachi chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. God's word says this, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now here, we've already recognized Jesus' own words that Elijah has indeed come. And he, he hinges that upon, he never says John the Baptist's name, but he hinges that upon what happened to John the Baptist. And so we might say Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 were fulfilled in John the Baptist's coming that maybe his gospel proclamation that Jesus is coming is going to restore the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, and that this is going to stop a total destruction in the end times. And so I think verse 6 can can kind of point us to John the Baptist there, but my question of the text and why I think John the Baptist and Elijah's coming here speaks not only to Jesus' time, but speaks also to a time in Revelation, is in verse 5. When is Elijah the prophet going to come? Before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, oftentimes in the prophets, the day of the Lord is the end, is the second coming of Jesus, is the destruction of everything. It's not the first coming of Jesus. I wouldn't necessarily call that a great and terrible day, would you? And so I think there's room here, and I think we we see this necessitated by what we read in Revelation, that Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 speaks to a coming time. Many people, and this is is not my take because I'm no Revelation scholar by any means. If you want to talk to a Revelation scholar, go talk to most of the people in our Sunday school classes. They love Revelation, and they've spent lots and lots of time in it. But there are some who have an interpretation that of the two witnesses that we see in Revelation, that one of them may be Elijah. And I think this makes sense as a reading if we read it in conjunction with Malachi chapter 4 here. And so I think what we see is that Jesus' words here in Mark chapter 9 may speak to something that is coming. That the second coming of the Son of Man also involves Elijah, that Elijah has indeed come and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it was written of him. But this might not be the end of the story. And so in in conclusion, church, I I think this morning, what we see in, in a difficult text this morning is we serve a God whose signs have come to pass. That what he said in the Old Testament has come to fruition in the New that maybe even some of the things that he said has come to fruition in our day. And when we consider an end-time revelation, and we consider look on the horizon for Elijah, that may be a difficult thing for me and you to do. For even the Elijah that came in Jesus' day was known as John the Baptist. Some didn't even recognize him rightly. But I think it speaks to the broader topic at hand. We live in a day, church, where Jesus could come tomorrow. We live in a day, if he doesn't come tomorrow, we ought to heed his words and we better be watching and we better be waiting. For the God who has seen the prophecies of of yesterday come to pass, he is the one seeing the prophecies of tomorrow that they would come to pass as well. And the high warning in all of this to a church this morning and to take to a world outside of these walls is that there is a world around us who is not watching and waiting, who is going with the flow and the momentum of the world around them, and it is frightening. Because when we look outside at the world around us and we see the post-Christian world in which we live, it ought to send up red flags and we ought to be sounding the siren that Jesus is coming quickly. And the world might mock and the world might scoff. But we can be certain in the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. We can be certain that he's coming again. And this morning, as an invitation, 
as a gospel message, I wonder for those who are amongst us this morning, when you look at the world around us, when you see that God has said, this will happen and it did indeed come to pass, are you watching and waiting? Are you ready if Jesus were to come today? As a child, this frightened me to no end because I said, I I don't want Jesus to come tomorrow, but I certainly want to be ready. It's not just the fear that Jesus could come, church. It's the reality that he is coming. And when he comes, I want to be found well-doing. This morning, I wonder, would you be ready if Jesus were to come today? Do you recognize him as the disciples did, as the Messiah in whom we can put our trust in? Maybe this morning you've never recognized him in such a way. Today can be the day of salvation for you. As children and youth have showed us in recent weeks, salvation is this simple. If we would but believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. This morning, if you've never been saved, I'd love to share with you the easy process it is to put your trust and faith in Jesus. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together in your word. We thank you that you are a God who has not spared your son, but you have given him on our behalf. Lord, we thank you that you're a God who we look back through the times of the past and look forward in the prophecies of the future. And we know for certainty that you are not a God who has forgotten us, but you are a God who is certainly coming again. Lord, this morning I pray for those who are amongst us who may not know you as Lord and Savior. And this morning I ask that you would convict their hearts, that you would speak to them by your Holy Spirit, and that you would move them to a decision to trust you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I ask that you be with us during this time of invitation. I ask all these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.